Welcome to our second Climate Action and Sustainability meeting today, August 23rd, 2021. And this is a Zoom meeting. So I will introduce myself. I'm Maryam McQueen. I'm Vice President of Yellow Springs Village Council and liaison to the Environmental Commission. And this is the kickoff meeting, the second one today, for our Climate Action and Sustainability Plan, which is a community pilot project going through the rest of this calendar year. This plan is coming out of work already be, having been done in the village for the last six years, first with the Yellow Springs Resilience Network, which is a group of volunteers that I was involved in. And secondly, with a climate action plan that was developed, especially by one of our Environmental Commission members a few years ago, that created a lot of data and information about where Yellow Springs is in reducing our carbon footprint. So this year, Council agreed to have a goal to create a climate action and sustainability plan. And we hired Piper Fernway, who will be coming on right after I, well, maybe after uh, Josue finishes. We hired Piper to coordinate this community-based effort. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Josue. All right, thank you, Marianne. I'm Josue Salmeron, Village Manager for the Village of Yellow Springs. I'm really excited to embark on this, uh, on what seems like a new journey, but it's really a work, uh, a work in progress for many, many years. Um, I'm excited that Council has uh, placed a high priority on creating a comprehensive climate action strategy. And, and part of that, a climate action uh, strategy is the uh, bringing Piper on board to lead the effort around uh, memorializing a lot of the great work that we've done around climate action and sustainability, uh, but also putting together a roadmap, a strategy uh, on how to move forward. Uh, as you know, the village has, a, has been a pioneer in a lot of uh, climate action related activities. We unfortunately, we just haven't had a, a good uh, strategy, a, a, a united front or an organized method to do this. And this is a uh, uh, one way we we are hoping to address that. So I'm excited to to join you tonight. I'm excited to be part of the work that Marianne has been doing, Environmental Commission, and excited to have a, a Piper on board. So Piper, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, so my apologies. Did not upload <laughs> the oh, technical difficulties. Did not get the updated times in there, um, but wanted to quick first go through the agenda. And before we start, just say thank you to um, everyone who contributed to this work before me. We, you know, Marianne spoke to, we had a community meeting earlier today and a lot of the past leaders in this climate action planning and stakeholders in the community were a part of that. Um, you know, Deward who wrote the past Environmental Commission climate plan back in 2015, Marianne with the Yellow Springs Resilience Network, and O'Brien's done a lot of work with bikes. So there's you know, this effort, this iteration of it. We're only here today because of all of that work that happened beforehand. So I just want to take a moment, moment to honor that and thank everyone who is a part of that and really congratulate everyone who is a part of that on us reaching this step we're at now. So um, what I'll be going into in this meeting, do a brief introduction of me, who I am, because I know I'm a new face to most of you, be going into details of the community-based approach that was mentioned. So plan steps, domains, and values. Then we'll talk about the ways community members are actually gonna be involved. The Climate Action and Sustainability Plan Steering Committee, domain subcommittees, and then going into most importantly, what you all came here for, community engagement strategy, how you can each get involved. So my plan is to hopefully cover all of that by 7.30, if not a little bit before. Um, so we can dedicate time after that to questions or I know some people have to bow out. So that's the plan going forward. All right, so I'm Piper Fernway. Um, it's a, 
lot to go over in this presentation and it's very word heavy. So this was really my only opportunity to use pictures. So I wanted to take full advantage of it. Um, so uh, also wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to relieve myself of pressure to have any sort of, you know, perfect public image within Yellow Springs because um, I'm not about that. I'm a real human and I'm weird. So top right is me. Um, working for the Student Conservation Association when I lived out of a tent for six months doing trail maintenance and was lucky enough to do that in a wilderness area. So that picture was taken with the crosscut saw I got to learn how to use to take down the hemlocks that had died and blown into the trail. Um, and it was on not so casual Friday, which is why I'm wearing a tie. And I was in the Mohawk stage before my <laughs> trail team shaved my head all the way. So. I grew up in Michigan. I went to school at Case Western Reserve University up in Cleveland, um, where I got a degree in biomedical engineering, but uh, really fell in love with sustainability and social justice and started on that career path in college. Um, and I really fell in love with how, you know, animal welfare, human rights, and environmental sustainability are all interconnected. And that so many environmental issues show that. So that's always been really central in my work. I did my thesis in environmental studies on deforestation because of palm oil in the Amazon rainforest. Um, but as part of that, we got to work at local nonprofits and I worked at a human rights nonprofit dealing with palm oil deforestation from the perspective of displaced indigenous communities. And then after graduation, I got to work on it with Rainforest Action Network because of taper and chimpanzee extinction. So always been central to my work that interconnectedness and we'll bring that into this work here. So I spent the last almost decade working for the same company before my position was eliminated because of the pandemic. So when I left, I was the community programs and sustainability support manager. And I worked on a variety of sustainability issues at 20 some different accounts across five states. So I actually moved to the area to be at a better center point for my job right off of 70, uh, closer to nature, but also wanted to get back to a small liberal community surrounded by nature because I worked at Denison University, Northfield, Minnesota, Granville, um, Oberlin, and just fell in love with communities like that. So in my work, I got to work with students on waste reduction, clean plate clubs, setting up composting programs, uh, in classes, the bottom right picture is a photograph a student took at one of our farms, an Amish mill, as part of a farmscape class studying the food system through the lens of a camera. My favorite was working with students to figure out a project that combined passions and interests that you wouldn't necessarily think could be combined into one cohesive project. The bottom middle picture is a local soda machine that I helped build and create. One of the few times I really used that engineering degree <laughs> to the fullest. Um, but that project came from a student who was diabetic, was interested in local food, but also was a sociology anthropology major and wanted a senior project that combined those three things. So after discussion, we came up with a project wherein she would raise awareness about human rights abuses coming from the Coca-Cola company and then recommend an alternative, which was these low glycemic index sodas from local providers. And I helped build a machine so we could serve those on campus. Um, and last, the last picture was, uh, cause I know Brian Housh is on here, uh, avid cyclist and have done a lot of organizing around that too. So one of my favorite events was the farm bike tour. Uh, I helped organize in Northfield, Minnesota. Um, and I think that's how my work with my previous company, my first job was a two-year fellowship. And 
then you moved on. And I was the first person that they hired on and actually created a position to keep me. And I think it was because with this event and other events like it, I went above and beyond my job description. So that event was a tour of seven local farms. I think we had 500 people come out. Um, we ended at a farm with music and food and raising money for a farmer whose fields had flooded. So I really love doing that in my work. I love coming into a community that already has so much going on and figuring out what I can do to connect it, what I can add to it and what initiatives would kind of high tide raises everyone scenario. So that's why I'm so excited to be here, be able to do this work that I love in this community I now call home and be able to build upon the amazing wealth of past actions um, that have happened in this community. All right, so no more pictures. Moving on to the plan. So I outlined in my response to the RFP that came out a community-based approach because Time and time again, that was what was being said in EC and in the community was, you know, we have so much going on already. We're already doing so many of these things. We're already leaders in so many aspects of climate action planning. We just don't have the plan. So I'm not here to start from scratch. I'm here to build upon and pull together all of those disjointed initiatives. So I laid out a community-based approach. And what that means is that community members are involved at every level of plan creation, not just at the start, not just once at the end, but both and everything in between. Community organizers, community organizations, excuse me, are recognized as change makers, celebrated and empowered because it's these community organizations that are already doing so much of this great work. And we want to recognize that and then help them do even more and connect them to build capacity and coalitions. Accountability is shared between all members of the community, including the village government, businesses, and individual residents. And that's crucial because you know, we talk about a top-down approach or you know, a grassroots approach. And it's gonna take both. Climate change is you know, arguably the largest crisis humanity is facing right now. And it's gonna take all of us working together to be able to address this. And you know, another thing that kept coming out of community discussions was that um, we didn't want a plan that just sat on a shelf and was words. We wanted it to actually mean something. We wanted it to actually move the needle. And to have that, there needs to be accountability. And it needs to be not just the village government, but organizations and individual community members. So that's really the goal here. The village does have a leadership role in a number of the domains, which we'll lay out. And that's a good thing because that means when we talk about tackling energy or water and wastewater, we can make big strides all at once and already have made big strides with the work Josue has done. So we want the Village of Yellow Springs with this community-based approach to recognize where it is a leader and be that leader, adopt policies, and really set a good example that other organizations and individual residents can follow. And then last, wanted to clarify using a data-driven approach and prioritizing strategies with specific measurable results. And that's an important distinction here because if you research other municipalities, a lot of people have a climate action plan or a sustainability plan, and we have both. And what that means, what the distinction is, is a climate action plan tends to just look at carbon footprint and carbon reduction. Whereas a sustainability plan takes a much wider view of what's happening, the different effects, the different mitigation strategies. So we'll be looking at water, we'll be looking at local food, we'll be, we'll be looking at metrics besides just carbon reduction and taking actions to address those. So that's why our plan is both. It's still gonna be data-driven, but it's gonna take into account more than just carbon footprint reduction potential in choosing what strategies to go with moving forward. 
So I laid out a 10 step plan in my proposal. The first step, again, in a community-based plan is putting together a steering committee based upon all of the people who were involved in this work beforehand. Because again, this is a continuation of past efforts. So we want those same people involved so this work can be aligned with theirs, learn from those mistakes and continue what they started. That steering committee will also be in charge of balancing plan values and community priorities, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, and then they will help come up with a decision matrix so that we can choose actions, we can choose strategies and prioritize what we're gonna do based on building community resilience and vitality. You know, climate change is happening. <laughs> we're, we're already reading about and seeing, you know, the flooding that's happening right now in Tennessee, all of the wildfires, you know, things are going to change. So building community resilience is about looking at, okay, based on projections, what is our community going to look like in 10 years and 15 years and 20 years and preparing accordingly. That's going to involve a lot with stormwater mitigation as, you know, rain events become more frequent. That's going to involve, you know, we, we had our first meeting today out in the almost 90 degree heat. Um, so it's going to involve, you know, there's going to be potential of food insecurity. So do we want to bolster our local local food system. So the steering committee will help us choose actions so we can guide our community into the future and be prepared for what's to come. And lastly, this steering committee, you know, we want to align what we're doing here with the Paris Climate Accord, with the UN sustainability goals, with, you know, the national, international benchmarks to make sure that we as a municipality are on track, are working towards those same goals and are pulling our weight in this climate conversation. So to organize the plan, because this is a lot of work, <laughs> uh, past plans, the Environmental Commission's 2015 plan and then you know past conversations with the Environmental Commission has split this work into these seven different domains energy transportation buildings native habitat water local food and waste reduction um, that's just you know all of these are interrelated when we were talking about a project building habitat for chimney sweeps, because they're being evicted from their current habitat when we you know, renovate buildings. A project like that would be under native habitat and buildings. So these aren't disparate domains, everything's interconnected, but we needed a way to organize this work. When going through those domains and identifying them, you know, some of these past lists had other elements in there that felt more like underlying themes than they did entirely separate categories. And that's where these values came from. So when going about this planning, we also want to take into account equity. You know, it's the BIPOC individuals, marginalized communities, those are the ones that are being most affected by climate change, and they will continue to be most affected by climate change. So when we're taking actions as a community, are we thinking about that? Are, are we employing equitable solutions? Empowerment, again, empowering citizens, community organizations to take action, you know, especially with the plan coming out of the government, it can feel regulatory. We want it to have everyone involved and have it be empowering and get people to be involved because they wanna be a part of the solution. Education, that's going to be, you know, all of these values are a part of every single one of these domains and can't be separated. We need to be doing education about all of these things with individual residents, but also incorporating it into the education of our local school systems. Are we teaching students about these different aspects of climate change? And all of these actions don't 
don't exist in a bubble. They're going to have economic effects and they can have great economic effects. You know, Susan Jennings has been talking about the potential to have a local food and sustainability tourism economy here for a while. We were talking today, Catherine Zimmerman with the Habitat team, there's already a map of, I think there, she said either 40 or 60 different certified wildlife habitats all around the village. That's amazing. We could team up with the Chamber of Commerce and make a map of that and have a bicycle tour. You know, there are so many opportunities to positively affect the economy here. And then evolution. Um, and that speaks to, again, climate change is happening. Our situation is going to change and we need to be able to evolve to address that. So really incorporating resiliency strategies. So the steering committee will be made up of one member from each of these domains, as well as one member representing each of these values. So just like Agraria, someone from Agraria will be on the steering committee to speak to local food. Someone from maybe Yellow Springs Home Inc. will be there or from the 365 project. So steering committee will, these members collectively will represent the interests of our community and make sure that the steps we take forward balance those interests. Okay, plan steps. So subcommittees will be formed for each of the domains. So there will be a different subcommittee for transportation, for energy, and individual community members can get involved in that. I want individual community members to get involved in that. I am not a proponent of uh, having meetings for the sake of meetings. And also as an engineer, I like efficiency. Um, and then I'm not into reinventing the wheel. So there's already a lot of this existing structure in place. The village put out a wonderful active transportation plan just in 2019. So there's already people who did that. There's already a plan. There's already a lot of that work already done under transportation. Same thing with native habitat. We have a habitat team off of environmental commission you know, that were the ones who got us certified as a wildlife habitat. You know, Mayor Pam has the Monarchs Pledge. So you know, the habitat team will serve as the subcommittee for the native habitat domain. And we'll just have to pull in a couple other people. So for as many of these as possible, looking to build off of existing structures, existing groups of people that are in place and just figure out who else we need to invite to the table to have everyone represented. And that's organizations but also individuals. You, know, you don't have to be the executive director of a conservation nonprofit to get involved with this. You can just be a resident that is interested in helping because this affects all of us. Um, so that's subcommittee formation. I will talk about this later, but the plan is that I will have forms up on the website to get people to respond with their interest in subcommittees, figure out availability and work all that out. I'll have those forms up starting Friday. And the hope is that subcommittees will meet in early September. How often these subcommittees meet and when and what they do is completely fluid. It's based on who wants to be involved and their availability and their interest level and what they wanna work on what the next step is after subcommittee formations and what the hope is that those subcommittees will help with is information gathering. So before we can write a climate action and sustainability plan, before we can figure out what we wanna do moving forward, we've gotta figure out where we are. So information gathering is figuring out everything we've already done and documenting it. Again, this was something that I heard time and time again the past couple of months is that like there's so much happening, but it's all disjointed. So if you walk away from this with anything, walk away that the purpose of this iteration, this climate action and sustainability plan project 
is to tie all of those disjointed efforts together under one umbrella and have comprehensive planning, cohesiveness, communication, build capacity, all those, all those buzzwords, but actually. So the first step in information gathering is a stakeholder assessment, figuring out not only what have people already done, but what are their needs? You know, what resources do they have access to? What initiatives do they have planned? And really figure out the landscape of what we're dealing with. From there, we can determine benchmarks, determine goals, and then eventually when we have an idea, we can brainstorm strategies and start building coalitions and actually come up with the ways we're gonna meet these specific goals. So that is a lot to do, um, especially in, in a way that involves all of, all of the community and in a way that, you know, that follows that community approach. If we're gonna build accountability, then we need to be laying out goals and strategies that actually are being done by these different stakeholders. We need to be focusing on prioritizing actions that we can actually do with the capacity of our organizations. You know, so this is a lot of work. And those five steps are all I expect to accomplish in the five month timeline of this project. So by the end of the year, and I've said it before, I'll say it again, um, rushing that would be detrimental to the community and to this climate action and sustainability plan, because these next steps and six in particular is where a plan goes from a plan that's gonna sit on a shelf to a plan that is gonna take actual action and move the needle forward with accountability from all the stakeholders. And that's gonna take time. It's gonna take time to not only compile all of that information, but to then figure out, okay, based on that, based on what we already have happening, who has a resource that can meet a need over here? What collaborations can we help form that you know, are mutually beneficial and makes everyone more successful. That's what it's going to take time to do. So when we have a plan, we want to have very clear goals laid out that we can reach and know how we're going to reach them with specific strategies and who's going to be doing each of them. So that's why I have a question mark after a five-year plan. So most communities put out a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. Um, and I know we're behind and I know there's a rush. So Oberlin has had a plan out for a decade already. Um, but a lot of this plan and what, what we're doing here is taking advantage of the fact that we're a little bit late to the game in terms of the actual planning and doing the research as to what are other people doing? What, what are the benchmarks they're using? What are the goals? What are the strategies? Like we can, we can not reinvent the wheel and use that as a template and figure out what works best for us. But then when we do have a plan, we wanna have all of that really laid out and know what we're gonna reach. So I have a question mark after five year plan because maybe it takes us a year to write a plan and we decide to do a seven year plan because 2030 is coming up and that's, um, a time when a lot of cities have, we will reach X goal by then. So again, fluidity with a community-based plan, I don't know exactly where it's gonna go. So want to leave space for that to evolve um, as it needs to. After that will be community feedback and then integration. So community feedback, having another meeting like this, and larger and probably many of them because of so much information. So it will probably happen by domain, but getting feedback from the community who wasn't a part of the planning from the start, still giving them the opportunity to weigh in before we finalize this. Integration being from what we find out, you know, we may have missed a huge stakeholder or a huge part of the conversation we didn't even think about. So we need to go back to the drawing board and go back to step three and in information gathering and, you know, work our way back up. But then finally, 
plan consolidation and approval, and then five-year plan deployment. So all of those disparate domains will eventually need to be incorporated into one comprehensive plan and have you know, separate strategies and actions in each of them make sense in relation to one another, but also as a whole move us towards that resiliency that we're looking for. And then step 10, you know, this, this isn't check and then we're done. <laughs> this is where the real work begins. This is where, okay, now we actually have to do all of the things, actually employ all of the strategies that we laid out to reach these goals in that amount of time. Um, and that's another reason I think potentially an eight-year plan would be the right fit for us because when I was part of climate action planning in universities, you know, the one I was involved with most heavily, it was a five-year plan. And then every year, the fourth year, the whole fourth year was just planning. <laughs> so you actually only had about three years to do anything. What with, you know, starting to plan and then setting up how you're going to do the plan after you published it. So this is a long process, but um, I don't want to downplay what a big step the village is taking by taking this step. It's just, this is great. There's so much to be done. We'll do a ton of work in the next five months, but it is gonna take longer than that to do this right. All right. So community engagement strategy. So why you all are here, how you can get involved. Um, so we've talked about the community-based plan and congratulations, you've already done one of the things to get involved. You've attended a community meeting. Um, there's also been press. Maybe you found out about this meeting through stories in the Yellow Springs news. And then, you know, the community and community members will have the opportunity to join steering committee and the subcommittees. But there's a lot more to that than that to community engagement. You know, we've there's so much excitement here from individual residents. Um, you know, I've only been in this position for three weeks now, but already I've had so many people come up to me and talk about, you know, a project they want to do with their church or with their school or, you know, getting their neighbors to pledge to compost or something. And all of that is fantastic. Um, but the reality of it is this position, my position is only through the end of the year only part-time and has a huge scope of work that doesn't include very much room for like actions, sadly, because a lot of it is figuring out where we are before we can do those actions. But I'm a big proponent of doing while planning um, because of so many plans never getting to the doing phase. Um, so I really wanted to come up with some community engagement strategies so while we're doing this planning phase, there could still be actions and we could still you know, get people excited and empower people to take the actions that they're already taking and encourage that and include them in this climate action planning process by including what they're doing. So there are three main ways we are going to engage the community beyond the subcommittees and steering committee. So the first is websites and forms, encouraging individual actions, and then projects. So for website and forms, I have been working with the wonderful Philip O'Rourke, who does marketing for the village, and we have a homepage for the Climate Action and Sustainability Plan. Um, that will be updated regularly. My goal is that that is the home for all of this work. And that, you know, by the end of this five months, once we have that information gathering, that that web page will be like a, a home page and a database of everything that's happening. So as a new resident to the community, you know, I was surprised that that didn't already exist, that there wasn't already a place I could go and be like, hey, I'm someone passionate about environmental issues. Like, who are the players? Who do I volunteer with? Or what events are happening? Um, there's not a specific place for all of that sustainability related stuff to live. And that's what we're looking to create. So that there would be an event list, there would be you know who, who to volunteer with, all of the volunteer opportunities. And that by having that communication, having that umbrella 
where everything's in one place. Again, the hope is that we'll build capacity for all of these organizations by being able to share that information more easily. So by Friday on this website, so the website is up and running. You can go to it now. It's pretty sparse, but it, it has some information. We will be building that out substantially. And by Friday, there will be forms, like Google forms on there um, for people to give input. Um, so input on the Climate Action Sustainability Plan, questions and comments, and then how to get, get involved. And this is just as a time saver for me. And again, because I'm a nerd and love systems. So um, rather than have you email me that you want to get involved, I'll just have a form up that says, who are you? What do you want to get involved in? What domains are you interested in? You know, what, what are, kind of work are you interested in doing? And then what's your availability? Are you looking to come to subcommittee meetings? And if so, you know, what times work? So by Friday, those will be up and then I'll be able to have all that information already organized and be able to get back to people about scheduling subcommittee meetings and how to get involved. And then for you know, questions, comments, and then input, you know, I want the, I wanna do this action with my neighbors or I wanna do this project with my church. It doesn't fit within this part of the plan necessarily, just because it's a little cart before the horse, but we want all of that. We want to track all of that. And I want to have a big list to come back to when it comes to strategies and where we're going to put our effort to be able to say, oh yeah, this community member had this idea. I think that's great. And that really fits within the values of this domain and what we're trying to do. So let's, let's put that as one of the strategies or as one of the goals. So all of that information we still want, even if we can't use it just yet. Then we want to encourage individual actions. You know, it's it's going to take it's going to take the grassroots, the individual efforts, and the top down. You know, this is this is a crisis. Uh, we're already in it. We need to deal with it. So it's not one or the other. It's both. So just because I'm working on planning and a little bit of top down um, doesn't make the encouraging individual actions any less important. So the first takeaway for people here is I want you to keep doing what you're doing. I want you to do those things. I want you to tell me your ideas. I want you to get your neighbors to do them. Um, but going forward, this is going to be a much bigger part of this project if it gets funded into 2022 and we can continue this work. So to get us started there, I've been having conversations and we're starting a partnership with Dayton Regional Green. Um, they have a green business certification program. And as a green certified business, you have access to this platform. So you can get your employees to do these different sustainability challenges. And for each one you complete, you get points and then you get entered in to win prizes. Um, so, we as a municipality can actually be a green certified business and then all residents can have access to this, bring your green platform and have this entire list. I think there's something like 60, maybe even more um, suggested individual actions to take to be more sustainable. So the goal is that that would be up and running very soon. But then long-term, the hope is that we can deepen our partnership with them and make that platform even more specific to Yellow Springs for Yellow Springs residents. So I was on there the other day and one of the actions is, you know, remove invasive species from your yard and plant a pollinator, pollinator habitat instead. That's great. But for a Yellow Springs specific one, I would want information on how to then make that habitat, you know, what plants to choose so it fits within the mayor's monarch pledge, how to get it certified as a wildlife habitat and upload it on our list so it's on that map. So long term, really working on expanding and specializing that individual actions list and platform for use. And the last area is projects. So it was a conversation topic, both of the Environmental Commission and of the Selection Committee 
that hired me that, you know, this is planning and we need to focus on the planning and there's a lot to do with the planning, but also we should have some projects to demonstrate the value because it is only funded through the end of the year. And we want to demonstrate the value of having it funded long-term and the need for this in the community long-term. So I will be focusing on two to three projects, which was the recommendation of both of those committees um, that demonstrate value of having this in the community. So we're already looking into a couple. There's potentially a compost pilot, maybe a rain garden, maybe some chimney swift habitat, but um, there will be a couple projects that I'll be focusing on that we'll look to have completed during this five month time period. And again, the goal of those would be just again, a pilot, a pilot project of this is the best way to have say a rain garden. So we did it right. You know, we had it with all of the right people at the table. It mitigates stormwater, but also involves pollinator habitat. We got it certified as a pollinator habitat and wildlife habitat. And we did the right education and just do everything right, have all the right partners at the table and document it. So we have clear instructions, whether that's a pamphlet, whether that's a video. So it's easily replicable going forward. So it's not the be all end all. We're not gonna solve all stormwater mitigation issues with this one uh, rain garden, but we'll have done it really well this one place. And then as part of the plan, we'll look at what are the next sites? Where else can we do this? How can we provide these materials to residents so they can do it? How can we encourage businesses to do it? Uh, should we look at rebate programs to help incentivize doing this? All of that stuff. So that's the projects to demonstrate value. Second, educational projects. So because of my past work with universities. I just love incorporating this stuff into education and it's mutually beneficial because, you know, project-based learning I know is a big thing here. Just living learning lab is the buzzword in universities. Just students gain so much from actually doing these things. Um, but also with the right projects, it's gonna help me. It's gonna help this plan to have them help with the work. So already I am advising a senior project at the University of Dayton to help with this project. My hope is to get similar projects going at Antioch College, the Antioch School, Yellow Springs School. So incorporating some of these projects into the schools here. And then lastly, we have sustainability champions. So again, there's so many residents passionate about this stuff, doing great work. And, you know, a lot of the wins that we've had as a community have been because of that, have been because of an individual resident who took it upon themselves to make a change. Um, but a lot of those too have fallen through the cracks. People have gotten burned out or, you know, there hasn't been the structure in place to help them succeed, to connect them to the different stakeholders that they needed for that project to su succeed. So again, that's what this project is all about, creating those systems, creating that structure. Um, so as part of it, I want to invite Yellow Springs residents who have a project that they'd like to do or have tried to do and didn't work, but who have a project and would like some support and some guidance on helping that come to fruition. Um, want to invite them to be sustainability champions and really help them and mentor them through the, that process and include their project as part of the climate action and sustainability plan, aligning it with those efforts. So applications will open this Friday. They will be open for two weeks and do the 10th. Uh, the Environmental Commission then will vote and choose finalists who will be announced in the Yellow Springs news on September 23rd. And then you know, they will work through the end of the year and see what they can accomplish. So projects will be picked based in part on the feasibility of actually making a change in this short amount of time. Um, and then you know, we'll highlight those sustainability champions work at the climate action and sustainability plan event at the end of the year. 
you know, having another meeting like this, hopefully giving an update as to, okay, this is all we've accomplished. And these are some of the projects we did. So highlighting, highlighting individual community members participation in that way. So to recap, the ways you can get involved are attend a community meeting, which if you're watching this live, you've already done, congratulations and thank you. You can join a subcommittee. Again, the forum will open on Friday and subcommittees will likely start meeting sometime in September. How often and when they meet is gonna to be totally dependent on who wants to join, who wants to be a part of that conversation and how in depth they want to go. So that's all fluid. You can share your ideas and feedback, again, on forums that'll be live on Friday. Individual actions, keep doing them, do them as part of the Dayton Regional Green platform. Apply to be a sustainability champion if you have a specific project that you'd like to do. And then community feedback. I think that was step eight on the plan. So that will be next year if it gets funded going forward. But um, yeah, come back and give feedback as to the direction the plan went and help us craft it going forward. Cause this is, I can't reiterate enough. This is a community-based plan. You know, climate change is not gonna be solved by government action alone or by individual citizens action alone, at least not in time. We're already in the midst of this crisis. Um, so it's, it's gonna take everyone and we'll just be so much more efficient and effective if, we do a community-based plan, and from the start, it's passionate residents, community organizations and businesses, and the village government all at the table at the same time. So that's the plan going forward. So that was all I have. Wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. So feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask. Thanks so much, everybody. Hey, Piper, this is Sammy. Um, I was wondering if there are, you mentioned that there are other kind of plans for other surrounding communities. Uh, could you, I guess, do you have access to those? Could you post those somewhere or send me a link or something um, so that I could look at, at uh, get an idea of what other plans for other communities should look like or what, what is possible, what they can do, what the potential is. Um, maybe so that, that, that can kind of help me wrap my head around um, what this is and what, what its possibilities are. Yeah, um, so I'm, yeah, I can send you, I will send you a follow-up email um, because I actually already have one put together. So when I started doing this work with the Environmental Commission, it was as a volunteer um, and started walking the Environmental Commission through, you know, you say you want a climate action and sustainability plan, what does that mean? So I brought up some examples and we looked at them and you know walked through them to determine, okay, we, we don't like this one for these reasons and we do like this one for these reasons. Um, so, and that will actually be a big part of what my University of Dayton students will be doing. And if I didn't have students to do it, what I'd be doing, but putting together a database of, okay, here's, here's Oberlin's plan, here's Athens' plan, here's Cincinnati's, Columbus's, but also here's Burlington, Vermont. They have a great plan. Here's Ashland, Oregon. They have a great plan. And you know what, what sort of things do they have in common? What benchmarks do they use? What metrics do they use? What, you know, in crafting our plan based, based on that. So um, I will send you a follow-up email, but the ones I just mentioned will be the ones that are in that. But also um, going forward, that's a goal for this website build out is to, you know, all of those, all of those plans are going to be referenced in, you know, the University of Dayton students project, you know, we're late to the game, but that's okay, we can use that to our advantage. So um, yeah, hoping to have a whole database library of these resources that we're going to use to build our plan. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Piper. I'd, 
I'd like to just piggyback on that because I think Sammy, when you look at the other plans, you'll see a wide variety from some that are pretty simple, I won't say simple, but short anyway, to others that are multiple, multiple pages. Um, and for the most part though, they don't involve the community very much. They're, used, they're primarily through the uh, municipality government. Uh, and that was one thing that we really wanted to have be different in, in part because there are so many players in the community that are already doing good work, but also I think as Piper said earlier, we don't, we don't want something that's just gonna sit on the shelf. We want something that people can get involved in creating and then will also be involved in doing so. But I, and I thank you, Sammy, for re making that request because I think that would be helpful for people to get a chance to see some different plans. Yeah, yeah, to piggyback on that, when we were looking at plans, I don't remember there being any one, like, we're, we're utilizing this work that's been done before us and drawing from it, but there's, I don't know that there's a plan out there that is exactly what we're trying to do because our community is different. Um, and these actions have to be specialized based on our geographic area, our, our situation, our stakeholders, our capacity, but also like Marianne said, not very many of the plans went with a community-based strategy like this. And the ones that did that I've found were um, pretty lacking in the data and the technical aspect and kind of took the community-based plan to an extreme of it became a narrative and it didn't look like there were explicit, you know, strategies for reaching any goals that were laid out. And if there were, they weren't backed up by, by data. So um, on the other end, a lot of the plans in the past EC um, report from 2015 was very data heavy. And that was actually something that was brought up by, by Deward and by Marianne and by different people as one of the drawbacks because people got so bogged down in the data <laughs> that you know they weren't able to move forward with a comprehensive plan. So um, we'll be looking at those plans to figure out you know kind of a happy medium and how do we accomplish all of those things at once with ours. Any other questions, comments, concerns, jokes? I, I can throw out another question or keep the conversation going. So um, this, is, this is Sammy again. Um, are there, is there anything that um, Yellow Springs is hoping to get out of this? Um, and I, and I don't know if I, I know exactly how to phrase the question, but for example, in the, in the article that was talking about these discussions in the, um, in the Yellow Springs News, Josue, I think you were quoted saying, there may be opportunities for um, having a plan like this in place that could be used for uh, grants or uh, proposals or development of some kind. I, I don't know, could you, could you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely, I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of a uh, lot of work that needs to be memorialized. Things that we're doing well, and there's no there's no um, documentation or strategy around it. So a good example is our eighty over eighty percent of renewable energy. That doesn't happen overnight. You don't get a community that could that is willing to pay more for electricity just on on a whim. So there's a lot of work that went into that. A lot of commitment. And it's unfortunate that we don't have it memorialized somewhere on how much work, how many meetings um, and effort it took to get to an over 80% renewable energy portfolio. Uh, so having that, having, having a lot of those uh, activities uh, documented and read out, I think uh, helped tell a story and help write uh, the historical record on the action that we take in a community. Uh, the other piece, there is that there are opportunities that, uh, grant opportunities that come up that unless you have something 
already drafted, already works, uh, is difficult to pursue grant opportunities. A good example of how we were able to get the $1.8 million that we got last year for the active transportation um, is because uh, uh, the, the village uh, went through the effort of having an active transportation plan. And when we saw an opportunity come up for funding with ODOT, uh, we jumped on it and we had a plan already written. We, we added some more things to the application and, you know, we got 1.8 million. And if we hadn't done that work, all that prep work, there's no way we would even have had a chance of getting active transportation money. Uh, Brian is on the line now and uh, he, he was deeply involved in the active transportation. And there are just some things that you have to have something, a plan in place or have done some of this preliminary work to even be considered. And so um, why, why eliminate possibilities for us um, when we are doing so much work around climate action? Brian, did I miss anything? No, I would just reiterate, I mean, in my you know, policy role with Rails for Trails Conservancy, I use our example and many other examples. You know, the plan is what gets you uh, to be able to actually execute, you know, meaningful action. But Sammy's question also made me think about Josue, something that is important to me and the village is looking at that you've articulated well, which is that we can also achieve cost savings once we understand some of the things that we can do as a village. I don't know if you want to emphasize that aspect as well. Oh, yes. Uh, one of the things that we are, are that I, we in the administration are looking at, that there's, there's a cost of not having climate action. You know, we're seeing it an increase. Uh, treatment of clean water. We have a lot of infiltration and inflow. So there's a cost benefit of being green. Yeah, I think to to take that a step further, um, that's that's where the resiliency piece comes in um, because you know the water is a great example. Like those problems are only going to get worse. And if we wait to deal with them, they're going to be so much more expensive. Whereas if we, we deal with them now in preparation for the future, we can avoid a lot of those costs. So there's a lot of reports coming out right now about all of the cost savings that are available for reacting to climate change right now and preparing for some of those things in the future. Um, Brian, did you want to add to that? I was just going to say a real basic thing that I think we can all relate to is just changing out the light bulbs, you know, just, you know, mm -hmm. some of those like basic things that we've done and we can do more of are ways that we ultimately can, you know, essentially pay for this work and also see returns as a village. So I see this not only as, you know, the responsibility of the village and our community to address climate change, but also that it's a responsible, fiscally responsible thing to do. I'd, I'd like to add to this. Um, you know, I, I moved to Yellow Springs in 1972 because of Arthur Morgan. And in a lot of ways, Morgan's idea about the small community really was about sustainability. Climate change wasn't a part of that at that point back in the mid 1900s, um, nor was uh, really environmental degradation and a whole bunch of other stuff. But the idea of having a community where there was a lo strong local economy, economy and strong social bonds was something that Morgan promoted, which is why we have what we have today. And for those of us who are deeply embedded into reading the probabilities of what's coming down the pike as I am, which is not mostly not fun reading, um, we're aware that on the one hand, we don't know a lot of things, but we know it's not great. And um, two things. One, the more we can be functional as a community and reliant on each other and our government and our institutions and our economy, et cetera, the better off we'll be. And two, I think that everyone alive who is halfway aware understands that we are in for some a huge change. And there, there are ways you can react to that. You can just hide your head in the sand uh, or, you know, or give up, 
or get very worried and, or, or get involved with other people and do something. And that act of being involved with other people and doing something is, um, there's value in that. And that's the only way we're gonna make a difference is by doing that, by getting involved with others and, and having the village government and the rest of the community function much more holistically, I think is, um, is what I'm interested in. And that the, all of this is why I have been promoting this. Thanks, Marianne. Anybody else? If you don't want to speak up too, you're welcome to put it in the chat. <laughs> well, thank you, Piper. Um, I guess I think everyone pretty much has put their email addresses in there and you'll be getting back to people. Yep. So does anyone have any final words? Thank you, Piper, and thank you, team, for joining us today. We're really excited to be embarking on this, this journey, a renewed uh, journey. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank appreciate you. the time. Thanks for doing this. Thank you.